uh, read by seminary students and, and university students. But what makes Richard Burnett such a tremendous asset to Theology Matters is his call and his commitment to serve church leaders, pastors, elders, church members. Uh, not only is, is he concerned about getting them launched with a theological degree, but he's concerned about sustaining them with solid theology to nurture them through a lifetime of ministry. And <clears throat> this is what Theology Matters is all about providing good, solid theology, spiritual food for people who need it. There's no greater proof of his commitment to uh, nurturing pastors, elders, church leaders than his teaching at the Charleston Atlantic Presbytery uh, Lay Institute. I mean, he's been doing this for years. How many years? Yeah, let's, let's hear it for the Lay Institute. Charleston Atlantic Presbytery. How many years, Richard? 17, 18 years of teaching to people hungry for the Word of God, and he's developed a, a huge assembly of groupies, who uh, many of, of whom are here, I'm sure. <laughs> Just one other thing about Richard, per personal depth to him. 20th century theologian Karl Barth is generally considered to be one of the two greatest Reformed theologians, along with the 16th century John Calvin. And when I was a pastor, I would regularly check uh, on Bart whenever I'd read any text or preach on any text. What did Bart have to say? The problem for, for those of us who, who do that is Bart is incredibly sprawling and very, very deep, written over a huge number of years. It is very, very hard for even a studied pastor to have a, a really good comprehensive view of Bart and his theology. And no book has been more helpful to me in trying to sort this all out than a book that uh, Richard edited. It's the Westminster Handbook to Karl Barth. Richard contributed any number of essays to that himself. And it, it's just a helpful way to get a handle on this great theologian. And it just shows his, his ability to, as an educator to, to teach, to distill the importance of, of theology for you know, minds that are lesser and are desperately in need of it. So he's a gifted educator. We're blessed to have him at Theology Matters, and I'm pleased to introduce him as our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Life is short. Bart is long. <laughs> and, and the, uh, we chose the theme of this conference as I said earlier, uh, or last night, uh, not because we wanted to be provocative, uh, but simply because we wanted to understand it better. Yet confessing Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life is considered provocative in today's culture, as you know. And there are many reasons for this, many social, political, historical, philosophical reasons, and all of them are worth discussing. But some of us here claim theology matters. So we believe our first priority is to try and understand what is at stake theologically in this claim. Rather than uh, assuming we already know all there is to know, what uh, we ask, is there something we've missed? Or something else we need to know? Or something we need to know better? about confessing Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life. I need hardly tell you gathered here that confessing Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life is considered provocative today. Many of you know it all too well. You uh, likely haven't shed blood over it, but many of you bear the marks, as Paul would say. And I hope you will discover at this conference, if you haven't already, that you are not alone. I hope you discover that there's a deep fellowship among those who hold fast to this confession and that, uh, that can nourish you and can strengthen and encourage you. And I hope you know this fellowship extends beyond those of us gathered here today. The fact is, confessing Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life has always been provocative. It's always been contested. It's always been eventually opposed. Sooner or later, in every culture, it's always caused conflict. 
And nowhere has it been confessed for long without price. The reason is because confessing Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life has implications. And this morning I want to discuss our theme in light of a document that sought to face some of these implications, and it's worth mentioning the price for those who did was high and in some cases could not have been higher. The Barman Declaration uh, is actually our, a commentary we have on this verse. The first thesis of the Barman Declaration is a commentary on Jesus Christ, uh, uh, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, and it emerged out of a uh, dark time in the world and a serious time of testing for the church. Uh, it was written under Hitler and uh, adopted on March or in May, 20, uh, May 31, 1934. Uh, 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 by uh, about a, 139 delegates, a little fewer than we've got uh, registered for this conference, uh, 86 clergy, uh, 53 lay folk. Uh, there were a number of businessmen, lawyers, a couple of aristocrats, a farmer or two, and one housewife. They were among the delegates. Uh, they were Lutheran and Reformed uh, who met in a small industrial city in northwest Germany called Barmen. The Nazis, incidentally, uh, had planned to interrupt this meeting, but uh, they figured it would dissolve of its own accord, as had happened before. Uh, they decided at the last minute not to do it, but this, that time they were wrong. It did, something happened. And the Barman Declaration is widely recognized as the most important theological document of the 20th century. I suspect it is, but I also believe it's one of the most misunderstood. I want to emphasize and can hardly emphasize enough that this was written in a very different context and under very different circumstances than our own. I believe uh, there's a lot to learn from the Barman Declaration, but I also believe one should be careful about connecting dots between then and now, here and there. And so I would ask, uh, you to try and understand it on its own terms and in its own context. And I, and I beg you not to try to reduce this too quickly simply to our current political context or to matters of what Barman calls the prevailing political and ideological convictions. Uh, Barman explicitly discusses, uh, talks about against allowing political and ideological convictions to distort uh, the church's message. And so I want to uh, hope we can do that. And, uh, and the, but that particular concern is subordinate to a much, much bigger one and it, uh, that is in the first thesis. It, the, it's, it the issues this warning in light of a much deeper, much uh, more basic crisis and temptation. Indeed, the authors of the Barman Declaration claim they were seeking to overcome a theological temptation which, quote, for, that had been, for more than 200 years, had slowly prepared for the devastation of the church. This was not new. It was old. But to understand this crisis and temptation takes some effort. And so uh, I hope you're ready for a little effort. Each of Barman's uh, six articles seeks to address a specific temptation facing the church. Each begins with scripture, is followed by an affirmation, and then a rejection or refutation, some talk called the damnimus, we reject, of a false belief. Article 1 seeks to name the deeper crisis and temptation facing the church and was considered to be the most controversial thesis. If you don't have a, your packet and can't see this, it's going to be heavy sledding. So, Anybody needs the packet to see this, because there's some other things coming that you, you're gonna, I would like you to see. So raise your hand if you don't have it in front of you. And there's a young man, happens to be my middle son, uh, who will give that to you. You all, some of you, this is a familiar document. Some of you may not know it, but uh, here's how it begins. Familiar words, the words of this conference uh, theme. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. That's the scripture. Then comes the affirmation. Jesus Christ 
as he is attested for us in Holy Scripture, is the one word of God which we have to hear and which we have to trust and obey in life and in death. Then comes the rejection, the refutation. We reject the false doctrine as though the church could and would have to acknowledge as a source of its proclamation, apart from and besides this one word of God, still other events and powers, figures and truths as God's revelation. Barman's first article raises a basic question. What is the source of the church's proclamation? What is the standard or rule by which the church's preachings is to be measured? By what yardstick, what norm, what criterion is the church's speech to be assessed? Or to put it bluntly, on what basis, by what right, on what grounds does the church say what she says about anything? Where, finally and definitively, does the church get her understanding of truth? Barman's first article says, Jesus Christ, as he is attested for us in Holy Scripture, is the one word of God, which we have to hear. You know, we have to hear it first. You are here, trust and obey. Jesus Christ, the one that, as he is attested for us in Holy Scripture, is the source and the norm, the basis, the rule, the standard of the church's proclamation. He is what counts, first and last, as God's revelation. He is the ultimate source, criterion, and standard of truth. He is the truth, as Scripture says. Yet notice a couple of things. Note that not just any Jesus is asserted here. It's Jesus as he is attested for us in Holy Scripture. Many through the centuries have confessed Jesus Christ, but not all as he is attested for us in Holy Scripture. Many through the centuries have created a Jesus in their own image, and modern people not least among them. In his quest for the historical Jesus, Albert Schweitzer and said that modern scholars since the 18th century had sought a Jesus in the well of history. And what did they see in that well of history? Their own reflection. And so when a Frenchman like Renan would write a history of Jesus, guess what? Jesus ends up looking like a Frenchman. This happens and happens, different English, all, it happens. Uh, and of course, uh, Schweitzer is really no exception in this regard as well, uh, hardly any different in this respect. And the Nazis, I'm sure you know, and many ordinary Germans had their Jesus too. They had what's called an Aryan Jesus. And Susan Heschel, he, she endorses uh, Jim Edwards' book, has written a book, very important book called The Aryan Jesus. And um, so they're not only... Uh, they're not only the people were people who create Jesus in our own image, and uh, uh, they're not the, the Germans were not the only people to do that. And uh, we're all, uh, since I guess Calvin said the heart is an idol factory, we're all likely guilty in one way or another of creating a Jesus to suit ourselves. Which is why this clause, Jesus as he is attested for us in Holy Scripture, is so important. Yet note what else here is affirmed. Jesus Christ, as he is attested for us in Holy Scripture, is the one word of God, which we have to hear and which we have to trust and obey in life and in death. Note the phrase, one word of God. The Bible clearly teaches, as you know, that Jesus Christ is the word of God, plenty of times. Okay? Jesus is the word of God. John, 1 John, chapter of John, many other places. The, Bi the Bible also teaches that Scripture is the writings of the prophets and the apostles, is the Word of God. The Bible also teaches, as, our, as the Second Helvetic Confession puts it, that preaching is, preaching of the Word of God is the Word of God. So one might legitimately ask, well, then how many words of God are there? Well, they're not three. Rather, the, and the church has never taught that they're three. The church has taught that there's one Word of God in three forms, incarnate, written, and preached. Three forms, one word. This threefold 
form of the word is implicit in this statement. Jesus Christ, as he has attested for us in Holy Scripture, is the one word of God, which we have to hear. And the upshot is that we can't understand one form of the word without the others. We don't know Jesus Christ apart from the Scriptures, and we don't know the Scriptures apart from Jesus Christ. Jesus said, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, but they bear witness to me. In short, the three forms of the Word of God relate like the three persons of the Trinity. Just as we can't know the Father apart from the Son and the Spirit, or the Son and the Spirit apart from the Father and the Spirit, or the Spirit apart from the Father and the Son, so we cannot know one form of the Word without the other two. But why do you think confessing Jesus Christ as he's attested for us in Holy Scripture is the one Word of God which we have to hear and which we have to trust and obey in life and in death was so important for some in Germany in 1934, yet so problematic for others. It's because of the implications set forth in the refutation or the we reject part of Article 1, which says we reject the false doctrine as though the church could and would have to acknowledge as a source of proclamation apart from and besides this one word of God, still other events, powers, figures, and truths as God's revelation. Parenthetical note here, uh, in a pluralistic culture, nobody really much cares that much what you affirm. You can affirm about anything. It's when you start to reject things. That's what gets you in trouble. You know, in the first century, nobody really much cared if you said Jesus is Lord. You could say, say it to the top of your lungs. Nobody cares. But if you say Jesus Christ is Lord and Caesar isn't, that's, when it, uh, that's what catches you, okay? And so this is the same here. Um, okay, well, what, what were these other events, powers, figures, and truths that were vying for recognition of God's revelation, uh, as God's revelation in Germany in 1934? Well, they have to do with, of course, with the rise of Hitler and National Socialism. I'm sure many of you know of the, about the political and economic Circumstances uh, preceding Hitler's rise to power, you may know that most Germans thought Hitler to be a very decent, kind, moral, and courageous person uh, who had won an iron, iron Cross in the First World War, who proclaimed the virtues of hard work, courage, discipline, family values, and who preached against greed, self-indulgence, discipline, or preached for discipline and against moral decadence, uh, caused, uh, he repeatedly claimed, uh, had, been inf had infected uh, German culture through the Western powers, uh, the Roaring Twenties, uh, had infected West German culture like a disease. Um, and if you've read Mein Kampf, you know that Hitler railed against the barbarous collectivism and atheistic materialism of communism in the East, and then the radical individualism and decadent materialism of capitalism in the West, both of which he claimed destroyed community and especially the values of the German people who were naturally a deeply spiritual people. That's Mein Kampf. That's a lot of what is said. You all know, yes, blood and soil. He talked a lot about German, Germans being bound to blood and soil, but he proclaimed with equal vigor that the German people were a profoundly spiritual people, and that's the problem with capitalism and communism. Well, that's not all. Hitler sold himself as the great defender of the church uh, in speech after speech. Some of you know this. He promised to protect the church, pledging, I will never tie myself to parties who want to destroy uh, uh, Christianity. We have these speeches. Rather, another quote, we want to fill our culture again with the Christian spirit, he said. Citing 24, the 24th article of the Nazi party platform, Hitler <laughs> proclaimed, this, is in the, this was in the party platform, 24, article 24. The National Socialist government thinks the two Christian churches, Protestant and Catholic, are most important elements for the preservation of our national individuality. Their rights shall not be touched. Privately, as you know, Hitler loathed the church. He wanted to replace it. 
Publicly, he said and did so many things to demonstrate his loyalty to the church. I, I've spent most of my adult life talking about this stuff, so I, I, can't, I don't want to get off on rabbit trails. But uh, soon after he was sworn in as chancellor, he boasted in a speech in Stuttgart in, in uh, February 16, 1933. He said this, Today, Christians and no international atheists stand at the head of the German government. Uh, did you know, I didn't know this until too long ago, you could not be a member of the SS if you were an atheist. You had to at least be what they called a Gottgläubiger, that is, someone who believed in God. There was a new classification that superseded, or, or, it, or it was a third way for, against Roman Catholics and, and uh, Protestants if you wanted to be what's called a Gottgläubiger, a, a, a believer in God. They preferred that. But you couldn't be an atheist. Hitler railed against atheism. Did you know that? And he rarely missed an opportunity to invoke the name of God Almighty. Uh, my wife Martha and I have spent much of our lives trying to understand how, many, how so many good people had, uh, were seduced by Nazism, and not least uh, so many otherwise thoughtful, pious, and faithful Christians, the majority in fact. There are many reasons for this, many of them very complex. Uh, and the more we've studied them, the more we've wondered what we would have done. And we marvel that so many stood so faithfully. The German people, as you know, had experienced uh, suffering and death and devastation on a scale that's difficult for us to imagine, and, uh, and then an equally devastating economic collapse. Yet more devastating was the guilt and the shame many felt or were made to feel for their role in the war, the First World War. Even Bonhoeffer, when he came here, uh, he, he had a speech he repeatedly delivered while in America in 1929 and 1930, denouncing the injustices of the Treaty of Versailles. The Nazi party gained power not because the country was polarized, but because it had fragmented and fell into chaos. Hitler promised order. He told the German people they weren't really to blame for the First World War. Uh, they were the victims. Their cause had been just. Their motives pure. And laced throughout his speeches, he told them something that spoke very deeply to their hearts. He told them that they were a very special people for whom God had very special plans. He reminded them of the glories of their past and their potential for the future. It was not a hard sell. Who could deny the German people were not special? Who could deny their extraordinary gifts, talents, and contributions to this world? Who could deny the strengths of their culture, the power of their universities? And why, many asked, were so many of the world's greatest physicists, chemists, mathematicians, biologists, philosophers, and theologians German? Why? Well, oh, and oh, I forgot to mention the musicians. Bach, Brahms, Beethoven, Handel, Haydn, Mozart, Schumann, Schubert, Wagner. Uh, why? Why German? How does one account for this? Well, many claimed it could only be accounted for by one thing, the blood. There's something in the blood. That's why we sang that last night. They didn't know which kind of blood. Uh, uh, okay, there's something in the blood, they thought. They believed it. Uh, many claimed it could be demonstrated scientifically. The scientific community had long been influenced by all sorts of eugenic theories, especially the medical community, and not only in Germany. And it is astounding when we look back to see how many bizarre theories, not just some, a few people in the medical community, but the majority of the medical community and so many scientists believed. They were seriously misguided, but it's hard to argue that many who embraced these ideas were not serious people. Certainly, many were not. Many, such as Alfred Rosenberg, expressed these ideas in particularly virulent form. And we can sweep them all aside and as simply more or less sophisticated forms of racism. But may I share something that I find very, very disturbing? 
If you would have told them they were motivated by hate, they would have denied it emphatically. On the contrary, most of them would have said they were motivated by love and not simply love for themselves. The argument, you see, went like this. If what makes us special is in our blood and we're going to keep giving the world such brilliance, making such wonderful contributions, then do we not owe it to God and to the world to keep our blood pure? You see, you know, you can't, if you want to get to the bottom of racism, you just can't tell people to stop hating. you got to find out what is at stake in their love, inordinate love. Another topic. But to, <laughs> but to them, it is perfectly rational. I hope you understand, perfectly rational. And if you investigate these ideas and consider the events and that began to unfold in Hitler's rise to power and first year in office, you will begin to grasp the significance of Barman's warning. What were these events, powers, figures, and truths vying for recognition and acknowledgement as God's revelation? What were they? Well, they had to do with history, nature, and experience. Many felt under National Socialism that they were experiencing a national revival. Their sense of pride was being renewed. Their place in the world was being restored. Marvelous events were unfolding before their eyes against all odds, all the injustice of the world. After all the humiliation they had endured, the German people were proving once again how special they were. Hitler simply whispered into their ears again and again the myths, the myths that they had made up about themselves until they began to believe them again. And now from out of the ashes, the German race was lifting herself up again. And was history not proving again you can't keep the German race down? Who could deny it? Was it not clear that they were standing on the right side of history? Were they not experiencing a unique moment in history? Such views were expressed not merely by politicians, but endorsed and underwritten by many in the church. How do I know that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Ten days after the Barman uh, Declaration was signed at the Senate, uh, on June 11th, ten days afterwards, other ministers and professors, including Paul Althaus, Werner Ehlert, some of the very finest uh, uh, Luther scholars uh, in Germany, and they met and gathered in a Bavarian town called Ansbach and drafted a response to Bar the Barman Declaration. Uh, it's called the Ansbach Council, and it begins with an affirmation of Scripture. They all said they believed the Bible. Some of them covered the maps, probably. Uh, but I want you to note this third article, and, if, and you really, if it's in, it's in your packet, and... Uh, Please try and make an effort to understand this because it could really help you and your people someday. Uh, it's, I think it's on page 9, the Ansbach Council. And he, let me just read it. This is what they say, and this is, and this is in response, okay, a, a direct response to Barman's, particularly the, the, the first article they didn't like. The unchangeable will of God meets us in the total reality of our life as it is illumined by God's revelation. It binds each person to the situation in which he is called by God and obligates us to the natural orders to which we are subjected, such as family, people, folk, race, that is blood relation. We are in fact assigned to a certain family, a certain people, and a certain race. And the will of God always continues to meet us in the here and now. It also binds us to, a, to the specific historic moment of the family, the people, the race, to a specific moment in history. There are some remarkable phrases here, and I wish we had time to go into them, the natural orders, blood relation, assigned to a certain family, to a certain people, a certain race, binds us to a specific historic moment of the family, the people, the race. Anyway, that moment in history, all that. But the line I want to draw your attention to is this first one. 
The unchangeable will of God meets us in the total reality of life as it is illumined by God's revelation. What do you make of that statement? I mean, it starts out so strong and authoritative. The unchangeable will of God. But what do you make of what follows? The unchangeable will of God meets us in the total reality of life, of our life, as it is illumined by God's revelation. Now, what a marvelously expansive phrase that's so broad and inclusive, beautiful. God meets, meets us in the total reality of our life as it is illumined by God's revelation. I mean, who can argue with that? But what does it actually mean? It's vague. It's ambiguous precisely because it fails to define what revelation is. This is no accident. This statement was written in direct opposition to the first article of Barman. Jesus Christ, as he has attested for us in Holy Scripture, is the one word of God which we have to hear and trust and obey in life and in death. The drafters of the Ansbach Council thought Barman's first article was, get this, too narrow, too restrictive, too exclusive in its understanding of revelation. Now, there's an irony here, isn't it? Yeah, okay. The Nazified Christians who want a broader, more inclusive understanding of revelation. They were particularly offended by this first article uh, of Barman. We reject the false doctrine as though the church could and would have to acknowledge as a source of its proclamation apart from and besides this one word of God, still other events and powers, figures and truths as God's revelation. Their problem was that Barman didn't leave enough room for other sources of revelation. The Nazified half or part Nazified Christians wanted to affirm other events and powers and figures and truths as God's revelation. They wanted to affirm other sources of revelation such as nature and history and experience. And if not apart from, then at least besides this one word of God. You see, they wanted multiple sources of revelation. They wanted more than one standard, one rule, one yardstick, one norm by which to measure the church's proclamation. And of course, this goes for the church's ethics as well. Jesus Christ alone, as he is attested for us in Holy Scripture, by grace alone, through faith alone, as the Ref Protestant reformers had said, was too exclusive, too narrow. Now, you may say, wait a minute, aren't you getting a little carried away here? Doesn't God meet us in history, in nature, in our experiences, in the total reality of life? He sure does. But how would you know? How would you know it? How would you know it was him apart from and besides Jesus Christ as he is attested for us in Holy Scripture? Karl Barth said, yeah, God can meet us in through many means. He said, God may meet us through Russian communism, a flute concerto, a blossoming shrub, or a dead dog. And if he does, we should listen. But how would we know? It was him, the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, apart from Jesus Christ as he has attested for us in Holy Scripture. Do you see what's at stake here? I mean, how many of you have heard this, maybe in your own congregation in the last recently, oh, we really can't know the mind of God. God is so big. God is mysterious. God is ineffable. Ineffable. He's, God is beyond words. You know, Augustine had some of these same people in his congregation. <laughs> he said, don't say that God is ineffable because that is to say something about God. You say God is beyond words. How did you know God is beyond words if God did not tell you in words? Was it a hummingbird? What language did the hummingbird use? Yes, God is mysterious. You bet. Sure, he's beyond words, but how did you know it? You, okay, okay, perhaps you're asking, yeah, is this really such a problem? Uh, I'll grant you, it took me a while to see this. Uh, 
We had a professor in seminary who said uh, he had learned as much about God listening to Bruce Springsteen than from reading the Bible or anything he'd heard in church. I was sort of surprised by this statement. I mean, I was from North Carolina, and this was New Jersey. <laughs> they love him. They love the, like, he's called the boss, you know. Uh, I didn't know anything. I didn't know. Uh, I didn't go out and buy his records, but, I, uh, but uh, and I didn't really think about it. I didn't think about it anymore until later when I was a pastor. And I soon began to hear folks say such things to me. Well, preacher, I'll be honest with you. I can worship God as well standing on a seashore or watching the sunset or sitting in a deer stand as reading the Bible or anything I've learned in church. Or this, oh, preacher, I've learned more about God from my mother or my grandmother than anything I've read in the Bible or heard in church. And then it dawned on me, Bruce Springsteen. I don't know what they were doing when they were reading the Bible or what they were hearing in church, but I thought maybe it's true. But, you, uh, you know, maybe that is. They're just saying it straight. Maybe they have learned more. But you see, the real issue is not where you and I hear more or less about God. It's where we hear the one thing necessary, the truth. The truth about God. This is not a more or less question. Paul proclaims what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined. You and I may hear all sorts of things about God by different lights, including the light of nature, but how would we know they are true apart from him who Scripture calls the true light of this world? How would we know their true significance until we knew all things were created through him and for him, and in, all things, in, in him all things hold together? He is the source of your life, Paul says. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. What do you know about your life until you know him? Do you understand what's at stake here? I can learn all things, all sorts of things. I can look you up on Google. I can learn all kinds of facts, maybe truths about you and still not know you, right? And you can do the same about me. You can look, find all kinds of data, information, but does that mean that I know you, you know me? No. It takes, something, it takes something to be revealed. You have to tell me something of your essence. I need to know who you are. And you know, it's the same thing with the Bible. You can learn all kinds of facts and truths about the Bible. You can, you can memorize it uh, 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 and still not know the truth of the Bible who is Jesus Christ, its living center, who speaks in, in the Old Testament and from whom, about whom it speaks in expectation in, in, new, in the new in fulfillment. And it's, of course, the same about God. You can know many things about God. You can know uh, uh, flashes of, uh, regarding his power and divinity, uh, but you still not know God. The point I'm trying to make is that Jesus Christ is not just one truth among others. He is the truth, the standard by which all others are measured. Jesus Christ, as he is attested for us in Holy Scripture, is the one word of God which we have to hear and which we have to trust and obey in life and in death. Why is this important? Why should you and I care? There are many reasons, not least of which have to do with who you and I are. You see, there are still other events and powers, figures and truths vying for recognition and acknowledgement today that claim powerful authority in defining my being and yours. They are vying for recognition and acknowledgement by, uh, uh, even in the church and among many Christians today, apart from and besides this one word of God. They have to do with interpretations of our nature, experience, and history, which are being often in some, in some places canonized today as ultimately decisive, definitive, unimpeachable truths 
of your being and mine. They function, in effect, as sources of revelation and thereby compete with, if not challenge, and undermine the claim that Jesus Christ, as he has attested for us in Holy Scripture, is the one word of God, which we have to hear and trust and obey in life and in death. Now, please don't misunderstand me. Uh, please. Nature, history, and experience can teach us a lot. And, of course, we uh, can learn from our mothers and our grandmothers. I hope you know my mother is here. May I share what, one thing she taught me as a little boy? She said, son, life is too short to have to learn everything by experience. <laughs> Thank you. In other words, you best figure out what you believe. Uh, well, I don't deny nature, history, and experience can teach us a lot. I don't deny or wish to underestimate the power of nature or nurture. I don't dispute or wish to minimize the influence of our genes or experiences, nor do I deny there are certain immutable aspects of our being that we may refer to as truths of our being. I don't, den don't deny that there are many truths about my life and yours. Some truths may be difficult to reconcile with others, especially as some of us, no, all of us, are broken in one way or another. But the question I'm asking you is, what is the truth of your life? Ultimately, one cannot live by many truths. One can live truly from only one truth. Certainly there is a relationship between the truth and the truths of our lives, and I want to talk about that more tomorrow. But today I ask you to consider this one thing. What is the truth of your life? John Calvin says we will never know the truth about ourselves until we know the truth about God. The truth about God is he is, that our, he is our Redeemer, that Jesus Christ is our Savior. What is the truth of my life? Calvin and his contemporaries confessed it as the same as our only comfort in life and in death, namely, that I belong, body and soul, in life and in death, not to myself, but to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who at the cost of his own blood has fully paid for all my sins and has completely freed me from the dominion of the devil, that he protects me so well that without one, the will of my Father in heaven not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, that everything must fit his purpose for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of, his, of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. That's one implication of confessing Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life. And that's enough for today.